AP Biology, Part 6, Second Quarter Review. We left off with telophase, but we haven't finished cell division yet. Now that we have two nuclei and two sets of chromosomes, uh, all 46, in each one of the, the newly formed nuclei, we have to divide the cell in half. So the next part, after mitosis, is called cytokinesis. Now keep in mind, mitotic cell division includes mitosis and cytokinesis. So if we're talking about mitosis, we're just talking about separating out the chromosomes into two parts of the cell. Cytokinesis is dividing the rest of the cell. Here we have cytokinesis. In animals, we produce something called a cleavage furrow, and basically it's a pinching off area caused by a ring of actin. Think of it as like a little lasso tightening and eventually pinching this cell into two parts. And remember, these are phospholipids, the fluid mosaic model. And it's kind of like a, a strong soap bubble where we're pinching off the cell into two different cells. Remember, actin is a microfilament. And it's also the same actin that can be used in muscle contraction with myosin. In plants, they uh, produce something other than a cleavage furrow called a cell plate. This cell plate eventually becomes the cell wall in plant cell cytokinesis. Growth factors in cancer. Proto-oncogenes are normal genes. Remember proto-oncogenes, normal genes. But when they're mutated, they can become problems. They can become oncogenes. So uh, mutations in genes that make proteins are kind of what uh, cancer is all about. The proteins that control cell division are not uh, doing their job anymore. They're not functioning anymore. And uh, cancer is like a runaway train where the cell just divides, divides, divides. Your skin cells, your other cells, they're not constantly dividing. But cancer cells can't stop dividing. Now, proto-oncogenes, uh, if they're switched on, if there's a mutation that turns them into an oncogene, then they're a problem. The one that we want to focus on here is the tumor suppressor genes. They inhibit cell division. This is uh, an example that we talked about in class, P53. And if you turn off that tumor suppressor gene, then you're not going to suppress tumors anymore. And the tumor, which is a growth of rapidly dividing cells, um, can spread, and that's a problem. So cancer is essentially a failure of cell division control. And we have some checkpoints. We have the G1 checkpoint, where P53 plays a role. We have the G2 checkpoint, making sure we have the organelles and we have all the uh, stuff ready for mitosis. And then we have the M checkpoint. The M checkpoint is to make sure anaphase is ready to go. This happens during metaphase. P53 uh, is a gene, a sequence of DNA, that can um, make proteins to uh, do a whole bunch of stuff. It'll stimulate repair enzymes to fix DNA, which is kind of nice if you have a mutation that's causing a problem. It forces the cell into resting so it doesn't divide anymore. And it will uh, trigger the cell to do apoptosis to kill the cell if you can't fix the damage. So if P53 is mutated, if there's a DNA sequence that doesn't work anymore to make the proteins, none of this stuff happens. And uh, all cancers have to shut down P53 activity in order for them to progress. And this was discovered by researchers. That's why we have scientists. So development of cancer, there's a couple things that go on with that. The P53 gene is the one I really want you to know, but you have to turn on growth promoter genes to have unlimited growth so the cell can keep on growing over and over. You have to ignore all those checkpoints, the G1, at, uh, G2, and M checkpoints, so there's no suppressing of the cell in the cell cycle. You have to escape apoptosis, so you have to turn off the suicide genes that would kill the cell that are cancerous. And cells that are cancerous are immortal. And, um, and they can uh, divide unlimited times. So you have to turn on chromosome maintenance genes, relengthening the telomeres. Might be a secret to making our cells immortal, but maybe we get cancer as a result, so we should be careful with that. Promotes blood vessel growth called angiogenesis. Basically what happens is the uh, you're going to turn on genes that create blood vessels. So cancerous tumors have all these blood vessels feeding it glucose and oxygen and all these other goodies to make more copies of the, the cell that are defective and that's going to um, cause it to grow. And some of our treatments involve trying to inhibit the growth of blood vessels to starve the tumor of uh, nutrients to kill it off. And then we have to overcome anchor and density dependent uh, genes. Basically, when cells touch another cell, what's going to happen is that's going to trigger the cell to stop dividing. And uh, if you turn that off, then the cell can keep on making more cells and create a, uh, a tumor, a lump of cells that are dividing. 
So what causes these hits? Well, mutations or changes to the DNA can be caused by UV radiation that's going to snap the DNA and cause those, uh, those genes to uh, not function the way they should. Chemical exposure, like formaldehyde, radiation exposure, heat, cigarette smoke will affect the, uh, the, the DNA in your lungs. Pollution, uh, age, just doing cell division over and over again can cause the possible mutations to occur in the replication of DNA that uh, may result in damaged genes like P53. And genetics, you can inherit some of these from your parents. Here we have uh, breast cancer. The tumor is fairly small here, so if they cut this out, uh, no big issue. However, um, if it's a cancerous tumor, malignant, it will start to grow. If it's a benign tumor, it probably won't grow. You haven't lost all those, those checkpoints uh, and other things that need to happen to have a cancerous cell. Once it starts growing like this, you have to cut out the entire area that has cancerous cell. Even if you have a few cells left over, they can divide over and over again and form a new tumor, and um, that's not going to cure it. You have to, cure all, you have to cut all of this out. And that's called a mastectomy, and that's pretty traumatic. And the worst case scenario is metastasis, one of the scariest words, I think, in the English language. When some of those cancer cells break off from the main tumor's uh, lump, they can spread to the brain, the heart, the lungs, the toes, anywhere in the body, and form their own tumors. And that's the scary thing. Even if you cut out all these cells in breast cancer, you could still have cancer, and it can come back. Someone might be in uh, remission, but it's very difficult to capture all those cells that might have broken off. And, um, and the chance of survival goes down once cancer is metastasized. Uh, if you catch it early, and that's true of all cancers, good, better chance of survival. If you wait too long, then the chance of survival goes way down. Here we have the uh, checkpoints. We have the G1 checkpoint that involves the P53 gene. There's a combination of something called CDKs and cyclins that are proteins that regulate this, and we're not going to go into any details on this in this class. Uh, we have a G2 checkpoint, make sure that replication during S phase was completed and the DNA is ready to go for mitosis. And then this S check, uh, M checkpoint uh, is going to happen right before metaphase to make sure the chromosomes are attached at the metaphase plate. Remember, mitosis is producing identical copies, and genetically identical copies are called clones. You know, make daughter cells, no female involved, just cells that have the same information. And they're going to have the same chromosomes and the same genetic information. All your cells in your body were produced by mitosis. You start with 46 chromosomes, you end with 46 chromosomes. Also, if you're talking about a different organism with, let's say, 12 chromosomes, well, all the cells would also have 12 chromosomes as well. Asexual reproduction is how single-celled eukaryotes reproduce. Things like yeast, paramecium, amoebas, all reproduce by asexual means. There's no boy or girl yeast. Also, some simple multicellular eukaryotes reproduce asexually by mitosis, making clones. Here's a hydra about the size of your fingernail, and uh, it's a relative to jellyfish. And this little guy here is going to make a copy of himself, but not really him, itself, by asexual or no two sources of genetic information just by cloning using mitosis. This uh, process of asexual reproduction is also called budding. So the advantage of asexual reproduction is if you're already adapted in a stable environment, you make clones that are also adapted to that environment. The disadvantage is if you, and another advantage by the way, is you don't have to find a mate. The disadvantage is that if it's a changing environment, you might have clones that are not as well adapted and if you have more variation in the population like you do with sex, there's a better chance that beneficial traits will be passed on because there's more diversity in the, the, uh, the process of meiosis producing gametes that eventually resi results in offspring with lots of diversity. So that moves us into meiosis. Here we have a karyotype or picture of the chromosomes. The pairs of chromosomes, you got one set of chromosomes from mom, one set from dad, so you have two of every chromosome number. The first 22 pairs of chromosomes, arranged from biggest to smallest, are called autosomes, and they're just chromosomes that are involved with making all the stuff in the body, like your heart, liver, lungs, all that good stuff, the things that are not determining sex. The 23rd pair is called the sex chromosomes, so we have 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes for a total of 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes total. 
If you have two X chromosomes, that means you'll be a female. If you have an X and a Y, that means you'll be a male. Notice that both males and females get an X chromosome. You need X chromosomes because they do have more information than just coding for sex. Things like uh, proteins for muscles and other things are kept on the X chromosome. You can survive extra copies of some of the smaller chromosomes, but if you get extra copies of the bigger chromosomes, the cell doesn't divide properly and the cell just dies. Meiosis is the process of making gametes, and gametes is a uh, fancy name for sperm and eggs. They're the sex cells. So meiosis produces gametes. Mitosis produces somatic cells, also called body cells. All the body cells in your body were produced by mitosis. Only the sex cells, the gametes, are produced by meiosis. So here we have a diagram. The multicellular, more than one cell, diploid, two sets of chromosomes, adults. And these adults have ovaries and testes, and in meiosis, which happens in those parts, produce haploid sperm and egg. That's only one set of chromosomes. So remember that mitosis goes from two sets of chromosomes to two sets. You're making genetically identical copies, including the same number of chromosomes. In meiosis, we're going from diploid, or two sets, to haploid, or one set. In humans, that would be 46 to 23. If you're talking about a different organism, let's say with 60 chromosomes, during meiosis, they would produce sex cells with 30 chromosomes, half the number. I like to think of haploid as haploid, or half the normal number of chromosomes of a body cell, even though that's not what it stands for. The prefix di does mean two, and ploid refers to chromosome number, or sets of chromosomes. So diploid refers to two of every chromosome. All right, so we have our haploid sperm, one set of chromosomes of sperm, one set of chromosomes in the egg. By the way, the egg has all kinds of other stuff in there too, like mitochondria and Golgi and all that good stuff. When they fuse together during fertilization, we produce a diploid, or two sets of chromosomes, zygote. One set from mom, one set from dad. And then you copy that one set from mom, one set from dad, uh, by the process of mitosis, and so all the cells in your body are basically copies, genetically identical copies of that fertilized egg, the zygote. The zygote is a fertilized egg. Then meiosis to produce sex cells, and they combine together, fertilization, and the process repeats over and over. Homologous chromosomes. The pre prefix homo means the same, so homologous chromosomes are the same chromosome, but from different parents. So you get two copies of chromosome one, two copies of chromosome number two. They have the same information on it. So it's like you get two genes, two sets of genes for every trait. It's kind of interesting to think that, you know, your liver enzymes and all those other things, you don't uh, have one copy of it, you actually have a backup copy. And of course, this will be important when we talk about genetics, having dominant recessive traits and, and such. Now, during the S phase of interphase, we make another copy of those chromosomes. So we're going from, uh, it's still diploid here, two sets, and it's still diploid here, two sets. Except every chromosome is now consisting of two sister chromatids. But these are the same chromosome. There's no difference genetically between these two chromosomes and these two chromosomes. We just made a copy for mitosis or meiosis. So here's a comparison of mitosis and meiosis. We're starting with four cells in this example. During prophase of mitosis, making body cells, somatic cells, where um, we made our sister chromatids, by the way, back in the interphase. Uh, prophase, chromosomes condense. Metaphase, they line up in a single row. And then we separate out the sister chromatids during uh, anaphase, and now we have two cells that are genetically identical to the starting cell. Now if you notice, there's half the DNA in the, the ending cells, but it's the same genetic information, a clone of the starting cell in mitosis. Diploid to diploid, one cell to two cells, body cell making. For meiosis, gamete making, we have two cell divisions. Mitosis was only one cell division. During meiosis one, this is the part that's a little bit different from mitosis. We have the homologous pairs kind of pairing up the two sets of each chromosome we get from each parent. And um, in meiosis one, we separate out the homologous pairs of chromosomes. Notice that doesn't happen in mitosis. Homologous chromosomes separate, we're going from two sets to one set. And going from diploid to haploid happens during meiosis one. We also have other things happening during meiosis one. We have crossing over, and uh, this is also uh, both the law of independent assortment and the law of segregation are uh, involved with meiosis one as well. Then over here we have our haploid cells. We went from 
four chromosomes to two. We went from two sets to one set. We went from diploid to haploid. And at the end of meiosis two, um, we did basically the same thing as mitosis in meiosis two. We end up with four cells total, going from haploid to haploid, separating out the sister chromatids, just like mitosis. And now we have four cells being made that are all haploid.